How can I be substantial without casting a shadow? A person must have the darker side as well. And this was one of the sayings of the famous psychologist Carl Jung. The study and the concept of psychological disorders are nothing new. It dates back to nearly 2500 years ago. The idea behind understanding any of the psychological disorder is anything that creates an uncomfortable situation or which is not normal, which is away from the normal would create a distress situation, a situation of discomfort, anxiety and unrealized potential. This would be where psychological disorders are generated. So in this section, we would focus on what are psychological disorders and why do we actually need to understand these psychological disorders. What causes abnormality or what is abnormal? We would understand the processes the approach and the history behind this concept of abnormality. Whatever is not normal is abnormal to simply quote. So in broad terms, I can say there are the concept of 4D. Now what is this 4D? Deviance, danger, distress and dysfunction. Wherever these 4D comes into action, the normality converts into abnormality. Now let's understand what are these 4Ds. The first is deviance. Deviance is a different phenomena than normal. So if all the students sit in the class and ask question, it is a normal phenomena. If one of the students sits aside and is very, very afraid to ask any of the question, this is a deviant phenomena. So deviance is a phenomena which is not normal and it is different or it is extreme from the remaining sample study. The next is distress. Distress is anything which is unpleasant or which creates an upset feeling for others surrounding you. So distress is another indicator of abnormality. It is not only unpleasant for you, but also for the people surrounding you. So that means there is a abnormal behavior which is witnessed. The next is dysfunctional. Dysfunctional means it interferes with the normal functioning of your life. That means if you normally do six hours of work, five hours of play, but a dysfunctional situation could be where you do two hours of work, sit idle for four hours thinking that I was not able to do anything. For the another two hours, you uh, probably cry. For the another two hours, you would probably curse others. So this is dysfunctional. Dysfunctional to simply explain is interfering with your ability to proceed with a normal routine activity or a normal routine life. And the fourth indicator is danger. Now danger could be to yourself. In certain cases we have seen persons harming themselves. In other cases it can be danger to other where you knowingly or unknowingly harm others. So these are the four indicators of a abnormal behavior. I repeat again a abnormal behavior the four D's are deviance, danger, dysfunctional behavior and distress. Now, as mentioned, most of the population usually lie in the normal curve. So a normal distribution curve, if we draw, we see a substantial section of population lying within the segment of normality. But there are extreme scenarios of abnormality towards the tail of the normal distribution curve. And whatever, as I mentioned, is away from normal would be abnormal. So there would be cases who probably do not speak at all in the class or who continuously speak in the class and most of the student would speak when required. So most of the student speaking when required would be a case of normal students. A student who does not speak at all or continuously keeps speaking would be a case of abnormal student in that classroom setting. Now, 
In psychology, we never have any ideal model. Uh, this is something that is to be achieved. This is ideal and must be achieved. No, since it's a behavioral study, we need to have a base for comparison. And that base is around the people or around the setting where the study is conducted. So in the same example that I took, a classroom example, speaking a lot or speaking very less would be an abnormal situation. But speaking when asked would be a normal situation. Now, let's change the situation. Let's say this is a birthday party. If the, at the birthday party, the person is speaking only when he is being asked, that means the person is not interacting and this would not be a normal behavior in that scenario. So, we need to have a base for comparison. Now, this base for comparison is based on the setting. As I mentioned, psychology is a behavioral study. We cannot have an ideal or a one-size-fit-all model for understanding abnormal behaviors. So, under the abnormality approaches, Usually, there are two approaches. First is the deviation from the social norms. Whatever is socially not acceptable and if a person does that, this is considered as an abnormal trait. Let's say going to school in a school dress is a social norm. Now, if all of the students or all of the students come in their school dress but one of the students every day says that I don't want to wear a school dress, I want to go in my own, uh, own wish, then this is a deviance from a normal social behavior and therefore it's part of a abnormality. The next is maladaptive behavior. That means the person is not able to adjust to the surrounding. 20 people going to a camp, 10 of them or 15 of them, 18 of them would enjoy there, but two of them would always be complaining, water is not good, tent is not good, facilities are not good, uh, no adequate lunch facilities, and that is a maladaptive behavior. The person there is not able to adjust to the surrounding. So either of those cases, whether there is a deviation from the social norm or the person is not able to adjust into a new surrounding, a new setting is a case of abnormality. Now, if those cases are short-lived, there could be instances a person is not in a habit of doing those things or has seen such a phenomena for the first time in life. But if those are short-lived, those are okay to deal with. But if this lingers and proceeds and becomes a part of a normal routine life, that person, the person by attitude would become complaining. Everywhere, be it the classroom, be it the school, be it the college, be it the uh, uh, job place, workplace, everywhere the complaints would keep on coming and therefore is an indicative of maladaptive behavior. So normality approaches we understand into two fashion. Also, there is one common thing behind psychological disorders. As I mentioned, it is a older concept, more than 2,500 years old. So definitely there had been some methods because of which these could be ruled out in the ancient times. So there have been lots and lots of superstitions, ignorance, fear about psychological disorders. There have been routine practices in villages, in uh, rural households where these are sometimes considered as a stigma. People are hesitant to go to a doctor to get a consultation. And this condition later on versus creating a alienation or a isolation situation for the patient in most cases. Now, when abnormality is explained, there are three bases to explain it. Why a person becomes ab abnormal or why a person behaves abnormally? The 
three reasons that have been cited are the first is a supernatural or magical power there could be a evil spirit there could be a devil who has entered into the body and therefore the person is behaving randomly this was the concept which was used in the ancient days even what we call as the shaman or the medical man as ojha have been commonly practicing these supernatural techniques the magical powers to rule out this kind of abnormal behavior from the minds of a common people the next is a biological or a organic approach now this says that our body and brain have certain disformity and because of the deformities there have been maladaptive behaviors which have increased and this is a biological reason to it if this biological reason is fixed the improvement in the functioning is seen the next is a psychological approach the psychological approach is usually caused by inadequacies inadequacies in the means of the learning process the thought process the feelings and a fear to take a challenge the person is not ready to do a difficult question to do to take a difficult challenge to step out uh, as or take a risk we can simply say and therefore these inadequacies create psychological abnormalities so there is where we explain the reason behind abnormality if we focus on historically there have been numerous people and their works and their approaches let's say hippocrates socrates plato they have been focusing on the organismic approach the organismic approach explains that behavior or a irrational a mal aligned behavior is the result of emotions and uh, thoughts Galen focused on four humors those four humors are air earth fire and water and according to him these are converted into the phlegm the black bile yellow bile and blood so those are the four humors and the four symbols for those humors as given by galen the next was in the period of middle ages demonology and superstition became predominant so people started to believe there is demon around there is a superstition and because of which the person behaves abnormally so saint augustine wrote exclusively about the mental anguish the conflicts that arise and tried to focus on the psychodynamic approaches then there was a period of renaissance now the renaissance as we said as we understand originated because of the french revolution john weir was the one who emphasized that psychological con conflict and disturbed interpersonal relations are the reason for it he insisted that witches are mentally disturbed and therefore require medical treatment not superstitious treatment or treating them through magical powers so witches are mentally disturbed persons and they should require or be given a medical treatment later on there was a age of reason and enlightenment enlightenment this was around the 17th and the 18th century under this most of the understanding related to faith and behavior was taken into account and because of which a reform movement came into play and this reform movement brought in the change in the thought of people where people now started to understand there is nothing superstitious about it but there is no magical powers no supernatural powers that can cure it but this is a process of irrational illogical thought which has been developed into the human mind so according to the classification we have two important classifications the first classification is by apa the american psychiatric association which is known as the dsm4 apa which is the american psychiatrist association laid down the various psychological disorders in the compendium which is the diagnostic and statistical manual uh, of mental disorders now this diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders marks down the various psychological disorders which we would understand in the next lectures where we would understand how anxiety 
Somatoform disorders are some of those disorders. The next important classification is the classification which has been prepared by WHO, the World Health Organization. And this is known as ICD-10, which is the International Classification for Diseases. And International Classification for Diseases 10, developed by WHO, explains how the main clinical symptoms need to be understood and these clinical sim symptoms are indicative of the kind of mental disorders which can be actually witnessed. So understanding and classifying disorders became a part only after the reform movement came into play. Till then, most of the scholars focused on the concepts of supernatural, magical and superstitious powers. So understanding how abnormality originates, how abnormality can be explained and the history behind abnormality is very very essential. What are the factors and the models underlying abnormal behavior? So let's understand these factors first. Under the factors we say either these factors can be genetic in nature or biological in nature. Genetic are those factors which are linked mainly to mental retardation, mood disorders, schizophrenia and these are carried from generation, one generation to the next generation. It is believed that there is no one single gene which is responsible for psychological disorders to occur but there have been strong cases to believe that genetic displacements have been seen across generations. The next is the biological factors. Biological factors overall influence all the kind of human behavior. There are wide varieties of biological factors. It can be related to genes, it can be related to endocrine system, it can be related to malnutrition, it can be related to, uh, let's say, any physical injury that a child had in the childhood. So all these are part of biological factors. According to the biological factor theory, uh, the reason behind this is when the messages are transmitted in the neurons, there is a synapse. Now the tiny space which is called a synapse separates one neuron from the next neuron. So the nerve ending used to stimulate one neuron to the next neuron is through the neuron neurotransmitters. Now if the neurotransmitters which lead to a specific signal has been disturbed, there could be reasons that biological factors come into play. For example, in the patients who have higher level of anxiety, lower levels of GABA are seen. In the patients of schizophrenia, higher levels of dopamine are seen. However, in the patients suffering from depression, lower levels of serotonin are seen. So those are some of the ways we understand how neurotransmitters play an important role in understanding the biological factors and the reason behind the abnormality. So these are the factors that lead to abnormal behavior. Now what have been the models? We would understand six models today and based on these models we have the six therapies. These models are the psychodynamic model based on which we would understand how psychodynamic therapy works. The behavioral model based on which we have behavioral therapies of reinforcement, conditioning, operant and classical conditioning which is seen. Cognitive uh, models which focus on cognitive therapies ruling out the irrational belief. Humanistic existential therapy uh, model which focuses on developing an integrated self and ruling out uh, the concepts of fragmented personalities. Then we also have sociocultural and diathesis stress theory. So all these psychological models are important. What are the reasons behind psychological disorders? Now, we do not have one single reason that we can quote. There could be a uh, lots and lots of variety of reasons that could be sought. For example, a child who is orphan, there could be a probability of insecurity in the mind of the child, maternal deprivation where separation of parents at an early age witnessed by a child could be one of the reasons. If there is faulty relationship between a parent and a child, this could be a trigger for psychological disorders, sometimes overprotection of the child and sometimes over uh, uh, 
kind of uh, over uh, pessimistic relationships could be one of the reasons for it or if the families are disturbed there is lot of quarrel lot of struggle within the families these are some of the triggers for having psychological distress or psychological disorders to begin with the first model the psychodynamic model which is one of the oldest and the most popular models it is believed that human beings suffer from unconscious mental conflict they do not want to or have it in mind but still they have it in mind so let's say a person who has a feeling of uh, getting into a good job and buying let's say a car would go into a unconscious mental conflict if the person is able to get a good job but because of let's say traffic problems or the city in which they are placed they are happy with the public transport and do not want to go for a car so there could be a unconscious mental conflict that can generate at this point of time the internal forces that come into play are very very dynamic in human mind and therefore it's very difficult to understand why a person behaved in a certain manner at certain point of time according to freud our human personality is composed of id ego and super ego so freud said that a, uh, a abnormal behavior is simply symbolic of the unstructured integration of these three forces of id ego and super ego that we have understood in our classes on freud's personality theories the next is the behavioral model now as mentioned behavior is what we do our actions if there is a faulty action because of a faulty learning a faulty thought a faulty knowledge a faulty uh, learning pattern is generated and this leads to a maladaptive behavior a behavior which is not well adapted among the uh, among the settings this can be ruled out as mentioned before through conditioning modeling the role models that you believe have been successful the person tries to imitate and reduce the maladaptive behavior in certain cases reinforcement classical and operational uh, operant conditioning works well the next is a cognitive model here cognitive problems are taken into account why person thinks illogically why there have been over generalizations that are done so a person might probably repeatedly think illogically and this can be ruled out by a cognitive model the cognitive model helps understand or assume that there is certain reason behind this illogical belief if, if a person says that i am not wanted i am ugly there is a conflict a mental conflict a irrational belief that is into existence the next is understanding the humanistic existential model now as mentioned humanistic and existential two words for which it is composed of human beings as a personality should be very very integrated a integrated means a complex personality where all the things are much more balanced and the personality is not fragmented when i say humanistic the person is born with a natural tendency to be friendly to be cooperative and to self actualize when i say existential that means there is a freedom to give meaning to our existence or uh, avoid the other responsibilities in certain cases now sometimes if a person tries to avoid responsibilities there could be a dysfunctional life the person at one point of time in the life would avoid the responsibility but would regret about it at later point in the life and therefore feel that this was not authentic this was not correct what i did and this would create a question on existence why i am so so there is where we have the humanistic existential model as mentioned i repeat again humanistic indicates since we are human beings we are friendly we are cooperative and we focus on being an integrated balanced self existential always question about the existence why we actually exist and what are our responsibilities the next is the socio cultural model socio cultural model 
where society plays an important role it could be family it could be peer group it could be the social networks the social scenarios the condition and the social labels that have been put on certain segments of the society so if the person the scientific study says that if people are isolated they do not have a good social support system they do not have good interpersonal relationship it is highly probable that later in the life they can become more depressed more aloof so having good friendships and friendly relations are essential in order to reduce the level of anxiety and depression in later stages so interpersonal relationships should be good and the personality should not be deviant away from the normal the last is the diathesis stress model the most widely accepted model it has three components first of all this develops a diathesis diathesis means a biological predisposition to a disorder which is triggered by a stressful situation for example if a person is put into a stressful situation a person might start eating a lot and this is a diathesis a biological predisposition to a disorder and that is triggered by higher amount of stress so what are the three components first is some biological aberrations are inherited so they could be inherited from the genetic makeup so that is the first component there can be genetic sequence or genetic chain of that biological aberration or the biological pattern that can be seen the second is the vulnerability vulnerability says how vulnerable you are to take the stress whether you are actually prepared you have an integrated personality to deal strongly with the stress or with just a small amount of stress you get very very distracted so what would happen when a huge stress would come so vulnerability explains how probable it is that a person could go into a psychological disorder or we can say how predisposed or at what risk a person is to a biology a psychological disorder the third component is further important which is identifying the presence of stressor what kind of stressor is there and what kind of stressor creates a trigger so this could be a trigger for a situation of anxiety depression or schizophrenia but identifying that stressor is important and under the diathesis stress model identifying the presence of this stressor and understanding the vulnerability of the client is very very essential let's move forward and understand the various psychological disorders to broadly understand we have the seven vast categories the anxiety disorders mood disorders somatoform disorders dissociative schizophrenic behavioral and substance abuse disorders so in this section we would understand all of these seven disorders one by one anxiety is completely normal till the time it is within a specific level let's say there is an examination fear of appearing into the examination fear of going to the stage for the first time fear of speaking in the public all those are certain kinds of anxieties these anxieties are not bad because these help us they motivate us to perform well but these anxieties if they are beyond certain limit they are higher than the permissible limit they create an undue fear or apprehension in our mind and then we start to have different thoughts different uh, bodily reactions to it which can affect our normal day to day life activities so if these activities get more intense the fear the apprehension gets intense what would happen as a result of it the heart rate might increase a lot of perspiration can be seen 
sleeplessness can be seen during night sometimes loss of diet loss of appetite can be seen shortness of breath inability to speak properly those are some of the symptoms which are associated with these kind of anxiety disorders now anxiety disorders if we understand broadly can be defined into five categories so let's understand those five categories one by one the first one is a generalized anxiety disorder this is a prolonged intense fear of something if you are walking on a road you might think that someone is following me from behind there could be n number of anxieties uh, i am being followed by someone i am not able to reach my home i am not even able to open the lock of the door how would i get inside the door there could be n number of reasons because of which anxiety levels could strike up and this is the generalized anxiety disorder so person usually under a generalized anxiety disorder which we also call as gad becomes hyper vigilant very very vigilant about each of the activities going in and around the person unable to relax unable to sleep a lot of perspiration could be seen bre uh, breathlessness could be seen sleepless nights could be seen and those are examples of or indicators or markers of generalized anxiety disorder the next is panic disorder now panic disorders are the anxiety attacks which are brought by intense fear or intense terror about something now again the symptoms are very very similar to what we have understood under the generalized anxiety disorder but here the symptoms can be more worse and sometimes a person can feel a loss of control over oneself and have a feeling that i am not able to do anything now and it's like uh, someone is pushing me hard i might die so those are kind of feelings or sensations which are generated under panic disorder the next is phobia phobia is nothing but a irrational fear about something now any irrational fear is explained under the heading of phobia now when we focus on phobia there are three basic criteria we uh, categories we talk about the first is specific fear or specific phobia as we call it this specific phobia is nothing but fear of something specific for example there could be certain persons who are afraid of moving in a lift there are certain persons who are afraid of height certain persons are afraid of certain animals and that is a specific irrational fear known as phobia so that's the first classification now if we go into the detail of phobia we have n number of names for each of the different phobias that are there so if you have time definitely you can revise those the next is understanding this as a social phobia people have fear of gathering fear of being in social gathering they are not comfortable talking to people and entering a situation where people are around so that is known as social phobia the last phobia is agoraphobia agoraphobia is a phobia which is classically explained by any unfamiliar unfamiliar situation that a person witness so such kind of persons who have agoraphobia are usually very unsecure they do not want to leave their home they are very very afraid of stepping out outside the home and that is agoraphobia they are happy within their confined space and that's the only uh, peaceful place for them the next is the kind of anxiety disorder which is ocd obsessive compulsive disorder now obsession means a repeated thought about something for example my hands are dirty i am constantly thinking my hands are dirty i need to wash i am constantly thinking the hands are dirty i need to wash so this is a obsession this is a thought now what is a compulsion compulsion is a act i'll go and wash my hand and again i'll think my hands are dirty a uh, obsession and then i'll go and wash my hand so any activity which is repeatedly happening with a repeated thought for example you might have seen certain per persons who while stepping out of the house would lock the house 
go five stairs down come back again again check whether it was locked or not then again go down come up and see whether it was locked or not so this is a kind of obsessive compulsive disorder obsession is a thought compulsion is a act and therefore both of these work together the thought must be there which lead to a action repeatedly the next is post traumatic stress disorder now as we mentioned before also post traumatic disorders are commonly seen with sudden unexpected trauma let's say a person living close to a coast witnesses an unexpected cyclone whole of the family uh, whole of the household the building is destroyed the agriculture on which they were surviving their livelihood has gone and those situations could result into a post traumatic stress disorder now these are commonly seen with natural disasters with any catastrophic event or a serious accident that uh, someone in the close family witnesses and therefore post traumatic stress disorders are again a significant form of anxiety disorders so broadly speaking anxiety disorders the most basic form of psychological disorders can be classified into these five criteria generalized anxiety panic phobia obsessive compulsive and post traumatic stress disorders when there are physical symptoms without any physical disorder we call those as somatoform disorders now these somatoform disorders can be broadly classified into four categories pain disorders somatization disorders conversion and hypochondriasis let's understand this one by one the first one is very very simple pain disorder so a person complains about extreme pain but there is no physical cause associated to it there is no biological finding for it In In the investigations, everything come out to be normal, but the person, let's say, keeps on complaining that there is extreme pain situation uh, in any organ of the body, and that is known as pain disorder. Now, to cope this, there can be two mechanisms. Coping means to get it, get rid of it. So, to cope this, there can be active mechanisms or active coping and passive coping. Under active coping, the person would keep on doing the routine activities and try to forget the pain. But under a passive coping, a person would have reduced social activity, would have a kind of social withdrawal, try to keep themselves aloof, and feel that because of this pain, they are not able to resume a normal life like other people. But still, try to uh, keep moving with it. so there are two ways of coping active coping and passive coping the next is somatization disorder somatization disorder implies that there is recurrent chronic complaint about some or other thing that happens very very frequently for example it could be fatigue it could be headache it could be nausea it could be sleeplessness it could be uh, any other symptom uh, it could be gastric reflux uh, but those are the symptoms that are without any cause without any reason without any biological finding medical reports come out to be normal but still the person keeps on complaining about these things and that is what is somatization a common incidence that we have seen with children who are uh, going to school but we won't classify that as somatization disorder just to cite an example that uh, a children who uh, a child who does not want to go to school uh, let's say who has recently joined a nursery or a smaller class would say i don't want to go to school and create uh, kind of uh, explanations every day and that is similar to a uh, the the symptoms that we are seeing here the next is conversion disorders now conversion disorders is where a person reports loss of any organ of the body now this could be uh, he can complain of deafness he can complain of blindness he can complain of paralysis but there are no physical symptoms for it biologically the person is totally normal all medical reports are normal but despite of that just after a sudden stressful situation a person is unable to cope with it and there could be instances of conversion disorders the last one is hypochondriasis hypochondriasis is a situation where a person thinks that the person is seriously ill despite 
having any symptom no significant symptoms but the person has made the mind that i am sick i am extremely sick my some of the body organs would be removed and that's the only way i can be healthy then and that is what is hypochondriasis so even after medical reassurance even after medical findings medical sightings the patient keeps on complaining that i am there with a serious disorder this would happen to me in next few days and i need to prepare myself with this so that is what is hypochondriasis so all these four types are the types of somatoform disorders we would understand more disorders in the further section dissociative disorders are disorders where a person has a disconnection between the ideas and the emotions so there is extreme form of unreal world that a person witnesses around themselves and in that whole event the person loses their uh, their own identity their own self there is a temporary alteration we can say in the conscious setup of the mind and the person is totally lost from what he or she is there and this is dissociative so dissociative the word means to dissociate so the person has we can say two different features the person tries to keep one of the things totally away from the other and that is where dissociation occurs now this dissociative disorders can be categorized into four types the first one is dissociative amnesia then we have dissociative fuge dissociative identity disorder and depersonalization what's the difference between these th these four so it's kind of developments one over the other when i say dissociative amnesia amnesia means forgetting unable to recall now the person is unable to recall all the information which is related to the stressful situation so the person forgets everything that stress that trauma everything is out of mind and that is dissociative amnesia and this occurs without any organic cause there is no head injury there is no brain damage but still the person would report loss of the stressful event the traumatic events that have occurred beyond uh, occurred in the life and that is beyond the normal levels of forgetting and that therefore we call this as dissociative amnesia note there are no organic causes no head injury no brain damage without that these are the symptoms which are being explained the next is dissociative fuge dissociative fuge is when a person has amnesia but amnesia which is loss of memory is combined with traveling away so let's say there was a stressful situation in city a now the person forgets first of all that stressful situation that happened in city a and not only that the person quits the city a and moves to city xyz and this is dissociative fuge the person has dissociative amnesia and with that amnesia the person tries to run away from it and this is dissociative fuge there are complete loss of memory loss of events that have happened in the state when there was a fuge the next is dissociative identity disorder this is also known as multiple personality so the person when was the person in a stress so the when when the person was in a stress the person would be totally different when out of his stress the person would be totally different so same personality with two different view points could be witnessed and one part of that personality is not aware what other personality did it's not that person is willingly doing it but person does not know what he did in the other state of mind so the same personality has two states of mind in one state of mind the person would do all the good things in the other stressful situation the person can do any contrasting phenomena contrasting things that can be done and this personality of the same person would not would not know what this personality had done so it's totally covered it's totally lost it's not intentional but it's not it's not in the knowledge of the other personality and this is known as dissociative identity disorder the next is depersonalization depersonalization is something like dream and the person 
separates the real self from what the person did or what happened in the stressful situation and it appears to be like a dream for that person so it's a kind of dream like state in which a person enters and when the person is asked later about the reality person is totally unaware about it so this is known as depersonalization and here the sense of reality is temporarily lost when the person is in the stage of dream so when the person is in the stage of dream the realities are lost in the mind and those are not permanent those are temporary in nature so those this is the kind of dissociative disorders so there is disjunction of ideas emotions and thoughts here in dissociative disorders mood disorders now mood disorders is a prolonged emotional state where the mood fluctuates now when the mood of a person fluctuates there can be different types of mood definitely a person can be sad a person can be happy so we need to understand the types of mood disorders under broadly three classifications a depressive state a maniac state and a bipolar state a depressive state as we said is a state where a person is totally broken this could be due to family tensions workplace tensions unability to achieve some of the goals that you have aspired for in the life and those all can lead to depressive episodes now major depressive episodes can lead to unability to think inability to work properly inability to sleep uh, do the routine activities now this probability of depression is usually governed by the genetic makeup of an individual. individual so there is a genetic factor that is predisposed to the factor of depression usually it is believed that women are at a high risk of depression during the young adulthood however males are at a higher uh, phase of moving into depression in the early middle age overall it is believed that women are more likely to undergo a depressive episode rather than men so the, those are some of the findings about depression the next is mania mania means a sudden happiness so euphoria feeling now this could be increased activity increased interaction very much happy about something being extremely talkative uh easily distractible unable to have good attention towards work so all those are symptoms of mania but we also talk about bipolar disorders now as i said bipolar so two poles one pole is mania the other pole is depression so this these kind of personalities usually swing between the manic and the depressive phase so the same personality would have episodes and bouts of depression followed by episodes and bouts of mania so few days of the month they would be very very happy enjoy everything around but the other days of the month the same person would be highly depressed unable to concentrate unable to do uh, the routine activities now uh, there have been instances that these bipolar activities could go severe and this could become life threatening could create incidences of even suicidal thoughts in an individual japan is one of the nations where uh, suicide is culturally appropriate way to deal with any negative thoughts or emotions now what are the symptoms where a person says that the person is undergoing a suicidal uh, thoughts in the mind now this could be indicative of numerous activities there could be changes in the eating habits drinking habits behavioral patterns sudden withdrawal from friends sudden rebellion against someone so there could be a sudden change in the nature of the personality that a person witnesses and these could lead to violent non violent and numerous kind of actions and those are one of the indicators of extreme form of bipolar disorders so just to understand again mood disorders mood swings are common mood swings are natural so if you have uh, normal mood swings that are common but if those goes into extreme those are under the phase of treatment so these could be under a phase of a depression or mania where the person is extremely happy or bipolar where alternate bouts of depression and mania are witnessed 
Schizophrenia is also known as a delibitating disorder. It is one of the kinds of disorders which is tremendously harmful for the individual as well as their family and the society. It is a part of a group of psychotic disorders where occupational functioning gets affected. Now, schizophrenics can undergo various kind of symptoms. There can be negative symptoms, positive symptoms or psychomotor symptoms. All these symptoms we need to observe carefully. Now, in the mind of uh, schizophrenics, the thought process is something which is affected. So, a logical thought process is not there. The formal structured thought process is absent. And as a result, there is derailment. Derailment means the rail should go on the track, but the train is not on the track. And therefore, whenever the person is sitting, there could be illogical thought. Talking to you about, let's say, an examination and thinking about what could be uh, the next few of this world or something uh, beyond the normal thought process totally illogical is what is known as derailment. So the formal thought structure is broken. First is derailment. The next is neologic, neologic or neologicism. Here the person tries to invent new words of their own. Any new word which do not have any significant meaning or existence but has to be created and those are known as neologism and the last one is a persistent repetition of a thought or a uh, act and this is known as perseveration so under a perseveration the person would constantly keep on saying the same thing repeatedly even if you have heard even if you have done the same thing the person would keep on repeating that this is to be done this is to be done this is to be done and then there is a lot of time in appropriate effect that means the emotions which should be as per the situation are not there for example if a birthday party is going on the person rather than being happy might suddenly start to cry and this is an inappropriate effect and this is part of an unsuitable emotion which is represented at a point where it should not be now a person who is Schizophrenic can undergo delusions and undergo uh, hallucinations. So the delusions are understood as a kind of false belief that are on inadequate grounds. Now these false beliefs which are on the inadequate grounds are to be understood very very carefully. Now whenever there is schizophrenia there are positive symptoms as well as negative symptoms as we said. So positive symptoms are a pathological excess of something or bizarre thoughts that appear into the mind. There can be disorganized thinking, disorganized uh, thought process perception and therefore a lot of confusion can occur. Now these delusions can be of various types. As we said under delusion there is a false belief that uh, the things are as they are on a firmly inadequate ground. So for example, I say delusion of persecution. That means if I'm walking, I'm having a delusion that someone is behind me, someone is constantly following me, someone is having an eye on me. So this is what is delusion of persecution. The person is trying to attack me, threaten me. The next is delusion of reference. Delusion of reference say that you attach certain importance or a specific meaning to the actions or the objects that are there unless they are they are not important but still you attach some important meaning and reference to it and this is known as delusion of reference. The next is delusion of grandeur where a person thinks I am the king, I am the universe and this is what is delusion of grandeur. I am the biggest and the most important person in this world. The next is delusion of control. Under this a person says that I am always under control, I am being tied by someone, I have to follow the rules, uh, my thoughts, my feelings, my actions are being determined by someone and that is delusion of control. So those are certain kinds of delusions that occur. There can be scenarios of hallucination. Now hallucination is where there is a perception but there is no stimuli. There is nothing that has happened but still there is a reaction. So there is a action without, there is a reaction without any action 
as simple as that so without any external stimuli the person has certain perceptions most common of these is auditory you keep hearing sound someone is shouting someone is screaming something is happening and there is someone is talking about you there are some people who are whispering about you so those are kind of auditory hallucination there is nothing happening nothing in the surrounding but there is a sensation that something is going around the next is tactile it's a form where you have a tingling sensation a burning sensation in the hand without anything without any symptom somatic hallucination somatic hallucination a person might complain that i have a snake inside my stomach the snake is moving inside my stomach and that is a somatic hallucination the next is visual hallucination visual hallucination means you would see distinct colors different person standing around a uh, different kind of vision that could be seen all of a sudden and that is visual hallucination nothing in real world but still you would see something there is nothing in the room you would see snakes hanging from the wall and that is a visual hallucination gustatory hallucination gustatory means taste so whatever you are eating let's say you are drinking a juice but you would think that no this is very very uh, bitter in taste so it is just a gustatory you are not even drinking you are just assuming that i am drinking and this is very bitter i am supposed to drink a uh, let's say a mango juice but this is not a mango juice this is a very bitter uh, bitter god juice uh, the next is olfactory hallucinations olfactory hallucinations means there are hallucinations of a smell you would smell something bizarre something uh, poisonous you might smell something smoky there is nothing around so those are various kind of hallucinations also schizophrenics come up with lots and lots of negative symptoms these could be loss of speech loss loss of clarity of thought to begin with so elogia is a common example elogia means poverty in speech the person is not able to speak properly there is reduction in the speech they won't be able to speak anything there is blunt effect that means even if there is happiness they would sit idle even if there is a sad atmosphere they would remain as it is there is no emotion at all they become emotionless and this is what is known as blunt effect the next is also a flat effect flat effect is similar to a blunt effect but flat effect is totally flat blunt is we can say a little reduced where even in a happy atmosphere the person would not be happy but would not be that flat but into a flat effect the person would be totally emotionless even if it is a happy moment even if it is a sad moment does not matter uh, the person would completely remain emotionless and the last is evolution evolution is apathy that means uh, it is a kind of inability to start or complete anything so the person is totally away from everything totally withdrawn from all the things around does not want to begin anything does not want to start any new venture does not want to end whatever is in hand keep everything as it is the next is psychomotor symptoms so we talked about positive symptoms negative symptoms coming on to psychomotor symptoms psychomotor symptoms are those symptoms where there are spontaneous gestures all of the sudden something would happen and this is known as catatonia now catatonia uh, is something which is very very common form of psychomotor symptom under schizophrenic patients so there can be a catatonic stupor that means a person would remain motionless for a whole duration and the people around them would be totally surprised why this person is not moving and the person would remain motionless for a very long period of time this is known as catatonic stupor the next is catatonic rigidity that means if i am standing like this i would keep myself my hand like this for a very long period of time so my hand would go rigid it would not move by all means and this would be the catatonic rigidity the next is catatonic posturing that means a person would assume any awkward uh, posture and would then not move and this is a catatonic posturing so anything that is bizarre which is not normal is part of catatonia which is a extreme form of schizophrenia that has come to and here the motions would be very very uh, surprising and shocking for the family members as well
so based on the dsm 4 tr classification there have been various types of uh, schizophrenia disorder classification which have been done the first is paranoia or paranoid schizophrenia paranoid schizophrenia is a schizophrenia where a person is occupied with delusions with auditory hallucinations without anything the person would keep hearing about things there could be uh, disorganized speech there could be inappropriate uh, actions or effect that can be seen the next is disorganized schizophrenia disorganized schizophrenia is a schizophrenia of speech and behavior there is flat effect no emotions and no catatonic symptoms at this stage catatonic schizophrenia is a extreme motor immobility where a person is not able to move not able to maintain the postures there is extreme form of negativism that enters into person and the person at some stage is refuses to speak you keep on speaking the person would not give answer to it the person would say i don't want to talk i won't want to speak and that is a extreme form of mutism we call it as mutism as well undifferentiated schizophrenia undifferentiated schizophrenia is a schizophrenia that does not meet any of the classifications that we have explained but still have all the symptoms that are present there and then the residual uh, schizophrenia there where you have at least one episode of schizophrenia that has happened in your life there are no positive symptoms but yes there are negative symptoms which are associated to it and that is what is residual it was there it is as a part of residue in your uh, existence and this is the kind of residual schizophrenia so those are the various types of schizophrenia next is behavioral or developmental disorders now these are commonly witnessed in children at various stage of growth children are usually unable to cope with the stress and are unable to explain the stress to the adults the things that appear very very minor to adults are very big for kids and therefore these behavioral or developmental disorders start to take a root at the very early age or the very early uh, developmental phase of the life now these behavioral or developmental disorders can be broadly categorized into two forms externalizing disorders and internalizing disorders externalizing disorders are those disorders where a person is uh in a kind of uncontrolled behavioral uh, situation where there is a aggressive phenomena that is to the others in the environment of the child so the child is not creating problem for oneself but for others around and this is a externalizing disorder internalizing disorder is a disorder where child starts to become uncomfortable within themselves so there could be anxiety depression discomfort within the mind of the child it's not outside and this is a internalizing disorder so both these kind of disorders are commonly seen as the child grows across various stages the behavioral and the developmental disorders are very common we can classify those under uh, six basic categories Uh, those are the attention deficit hyperactivity disorder opposed opposed uh, oppositional deficient uh, disorders conduct disorders anxiety because of separation pervasive development and eating or intellectual disabilities to begin with the attention deficit hyperactivity disorder now there are two basic characteristics for these kind of children there is insensitivity and there is impulsive hyperactivity even if you would ask the child to sit the child would keep on jumping on the table dropping up the things uh, hitting the things and this would be a constant non stop phenomena and this is a attention deficit hyper activity disorder the levels of high activity are high attention span very very low and therefore constantly in motion climbing jumping sitting dancing eating throwing so there is a kind of constant motion that would be seen in the series of activities highly inattentive so this is a attention deficit hyperactivity disorder the next is a oppositional deficient disorder there can be various kind of anti social behaviors or conduct behaviors which can be seen and the person is totally against what is there 
so these lead to aggressive development in personalities and these aggressions can be into various forms there can be verbal aggression where person speaks all bad names a physical aggression where hitting fighting is commonly seen a hostile aggression where injuring someone else become a common uh, habit proactive aggression that means uh, trying to bully others without any reason or without any marker and that is proactive aggression all of those are kind of oppositional deviant disorders where a kind of disobedient irritable behavior is commonly witnessed in the children these children tend to develop into aggressive personalities in in cases they are not aggressive and turn out to be non aggressive they could lead to sometimes violation of rules sometimes they can even lead to damage of things damage of property damage of individuals and therefore needs to be properly handled the next is separation anxiety disorder the children in this phase are unable to internalize themselves and therefore internalizing disorder where the ch child gets very very panicky about certain happenings for example if the parents go for job and leave the child behind or if the child has to stay at some other place for 5 15 days there is a sadness unresponsiveness that could be seen in one and there could be withdrawal symptoms that can be seen so very young children usually have sadness fear anxiety as a common uh, response to it uh, they appear themselves or they keep themselves withdrawn from the natural surrounding as they grow older they become argumentative they become highly argumentative and at the later stage they have a feeling of guilt or hopelessness so this anxiety and panic of separation is something a constant fear in that mind the next is pervasive developmental disorders now here communication with the social space is hampered autism or autistic disorders are common form of pervasive development disorders we have seen that 70% of the children with autism can be classified as mentally retarded so they are unresponsive to the feelings they are unresponsive to the happenings the emotions around and they are even slow performers in a school so if a child is unable to cope with a regular syllabus the regular school standard in which the child is there is a pattern of repetitive behavior a narrow pattern of interest areas which are shown those are all signs of autism now autism uh, kids usually have marked difficulty with interacting with others communicating with people they have very small and restricted areas of interest they are very very uh, particular about their daily routine habits and have a strong desire to keep themselves in a routine habit anything which is outside routine they are not comfortable with so those are the pervasive developmental disorders again we do have eating disorders one of the eating disorder is known as anorexia nervosa here a person uh, tries to uh, willingly keep themselves hungry uh, hungry in the sense that they have a constant fear of getting overweight and therefore they won't eat and this is anorexia nervosa the next is bulimia nervosa bulimia nervosa is a person would keep on having excessive amount of food and then once they have excessive amount of food they would have all the me medicines in order to uh, remove that so there could be diuretics there could be laxatives there could be there could be any other form of let's say vomiting that could be done but constantly eating more is important and that is bulimia nervosa the next is binge eating binge eating is frequent episodes of out of control eating so normally a person would eat normally but 
there would be sudden uh, cases where the person would start to uh, gulp a lot of stuff and then again leave it for a while and then there could be episodes of sudden eating and this is known as binge eating so these are known as the eating disorders and then definitely intellectual disability where a person has an IQ of equal to or less than 70 we say there is impaired adaptive behavior and there could be a lack of interpersonal skills functional academic development that intellectual and academic development that can be seen and therefore impaired adaptive behaviors are commonly witnessed so these are some of the common behavioral and developmental disorders commonly witnessed among children and therefore important to note the next is substance abuse disorders now before we understand substance abuse let's understand two terms substance dependence and substance abuse now substance are the substance which on which a person depends for example alcohol cocaine heroin are some of the examples now these are the drugs when person is highly dependent on these substances there is a issue of dependence that means there is an intense carving to have it i'll have it only once and then next day i'll have it only once and this is a kind of intense carving that develops so this creates substance dependence once there is a dependence there is a abuse that means recurrent and frequent usage is increased and then person starts to ingest these drugs damage their families, damage the society, damage the workplace and harm themselves. So substance dependence to begin with can be understood under uh, three important criteria, and those are tolerance, withdrawal and compulsive. Tolerance is the limit. A person has to make use of the drug within the limit and the person if has to use more and more of the drug to get, get the same effect then this is called as tolerance. So on the first day, let's say a person uses one gram, the, then one gram becomes ineffective. So to have the same feeling or the same effect, next day the person would consume two grams of it. And this is tolerance. Withdrawal is if the person is not consuming that uh, drug for a while, that substance for a while, it would create withdrawal symptoms. So there could be uh, unconsciousness that could rise and there can be significant withdrawal symptoms which could be detrimental in certain cases and the last is compulsive compulsive means a person is willing to have it again and again definitely I need it again so that is compulsive so three important elements under substance dependence first is the tolerance the next is the withdrawal and the third is the compulsive now coming on to the various substance abuses so we would broadly understand three major substance abuse for today alcohol cocaine and heroin uh, now alcohol is the most common one it is the drinking that is commonly said as now this interferes with the normal social activity and the human life usually the chemical which is present with the alcohol is ethyl alcohol as it enters the brain it actually retards the functioning it is carried into the bl uh, blood and supplied to the brain it slows down the normal activity so the person is not able to make sound judgments not is able to speak clearly not able to do the daily actions carefully there could be sometimes emotional burst of thoughts sometimes the person could speak loud or become aggressive and that is what are some of the common symptoms of alcohol now alcohols have been destroying families since ages there have been uh, families breaking up social relationships getting spoiled carriers getting lost uh, numerous road accidents are witnessed because of alcohol consumption uh, this also have significant impact on the children whose parents consume alcohol now this could lead to psychological problems among the children mainly in the form of depression phobia uh, anxiety stress disorders that can be commonly witnessed the next is cocaine now cocaine is again an intoxication that remains throughout the day 
A person who starts to consume cocaine have very significant problems with withdrawal. The dependence becomes very very high, and as the dependence develop, it predominates the uh, predominates the life of an individual. So withdrawal becomes very very difficult, and the same is the case with heroin. Heroin again, the person is unable to. Uh, Uh, leave it there is extreme dependence and the withdrawal symptoms even include sleeplessness extreme fatigue irritability anxiety fear depression if there is immediate withdrawal so any of these substance abuse systematic withdrawal is something which is recommended if we focus on some of the commonly abused substances as per the dsm 4 classification some of the common ones as we mentioned are alcohol cocaine heroin then we have sedatives which are usually given uh, after surgeries is again a substance people develop habit of using those uh, pain killers as a remedy uh, tramadol is one of the common examples that is explained amphetamines are common examples which are taken as diet pills caffeine uh, any form of tea coffee caffeinated uh, beverages like soda uh, chocolate coca are forms of uh, substance abuse then extreme form of lsd or uh, Uh, kind of uh, mescaline which is both of those are hallucinogens then sometimes inhalant people have a habit of smelling paint smelling correction fluids sprays uh, glues gasoline so those are again abuse that is in one form or the other nicotine in the form of cigar uh, tobacco which is consumed opioids which is mainly in the form of cough syrups analgesics pain killers you have lot of opioids that are seen Ad- sedatives again as we mentioned uh, some many of the opioids are sedatives in nature so they are uh, they induce sleep and then you have phenylcycladine as another common substance which is abused so those are some of the list of commonly abused substances and what is substance dependence and how this this dependence if regularized and repeated can lead to substance abuse and extreme implication not only on the individual the physical damage or the harm that it would cause to the individual the impact on the liver kidney and organs of the body but also to the family and the society by and large